Welcome to Herbally Yours, an adventure into the world of natural medicine. Here is your host, Dr. Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse who will help you take the leap to ultimate wellness. Greetings, and thank you so much for joining me, Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse, for another edition of Herbally Yours, right here on The Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Herbally Yours brings you the latest information about the many facets in the world of natural living. And today I am so happy to bring on board as our guest, Dr. Jean DeBrandt. Dr. DeBrandt is a doctor of chiropractics and is also board certified as a clinical nutritionist. She has published many articles on phytopharmacology and treatment of disease. She was voted Long Island's Alternative Practitioner of the Year and is an adjunct professor of biology and allied health for SUNY and an adjunct associate professor for NYIT. Her continuing education license renewal courses for healthcare professionals are published nationally and internationally. And she is a contributing author to anatomy textbooks and lots of other articles and books. But our focus today is on her brand new book called Global, A Traveler's Tale, which recounts some of the adventures that she had for many years traveling basically the entire globe, including leading field immersion trips with students to the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor in Central and South America. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Brandt. Thank you, Ellen, for having me. And we have a link for those of you who are listening to the show and want to find Global, A Traveler's Tale, which is the name of Dr. DeBrandt's new book. And the link will be right there after the show, when, you know, after we publish the archives. So thank you so much for coming on board today. You have done so much in natural medicine. Before we begin talking about your book, tell us what led you as a young person many years ago to be involved with natural healing. I just thought it was a wonderful alternative to what was out there. There weren't a lot of answers, especially decades ago. There weren't a lot of answers about how to treat conditions that weren't able to be diagnosed as an acute disease. And personally, I had an experience with hepatitis when I traveled in India, and I came back and I was clinically healing and doing well, but it was an alternative medicine practitioner who really put me on my feet and got my energy going again. So that really looked uh, very positive to me and helped to motivate me to undergo the many years of training it took to get my own licensure together. And then you went to chiropractic school, and then you became a nutritionist as well. I was a nutritionist first. Oh, okay. Uh, and an herbalist first. But uh, yeah, then I went uh, through the chiropractic program, and then I um, did a board certification program for three years after that, to get the, uh, which led to getting the New York State License in Nutrition. That I keep active. I don't practice chiropractic, but I do, I do keep my nutrition license active along with all the professorships and teachings that you do. And I might add, you were the uh, past president of the Long Island chapter of the American Herbalist Guild, and also you initiated its existence. Yes, I did. I thought it was important to have an herbal, strong herbal presence on the island. And you were very helpful to me in getting that up and running. And I will always thank you for that. Yeah, uh, the American Herbalist Guild is a powerful and interesting uh, knowledge-based group. And I was happy to bring that to Long Island. Well, let's talk about now what led you to this project, which is a big project, writing a, a very detailed book called Global, A Traveler's Tales. Tales, tales, yes. I wrote that book a number of years ago. It's gone through a number of revisions. I really wanted to document what the world was like before the Russians went into Afghanistan, before Americans were reviled in the Middle East, before we were rejected for our politics and rejected others for their religion. So it was a um, it was a labor of love. It was a way to recollect the wonderful imagery that 
is stored in my mind, but unfortunately not visually available. We didn't have cell phones then. We, my, my Nikon, if um, anyone reads the book, you'll see that my Nikon was destroyed on the Afghanistan border one night uh, in, in anticipation, which turned out to be unfounded, but in anticipation of possibly dealing with bandits. So I didn't have a lot of documentation, but my memories were my documentation. And um, I wanted to make a tribute especially to the women of Afghanistan. I love Afghanistan. It's a, it's a strong, proud place that has defeated conqueror after conqueror, and I hope to see it come back from its current dire circumstances. Well, I really love how you put right in the acknowledgments of this version of the book um, in the current climate of polarity, intolerance, and cultural misunderstanding. What has happened that we are in the midst of exactly that? (laughs) There are many ways to answer that question. I guess it depends upon what level we're looking. But here we are. We're in a very divided state. Politics has a huge role to play there. Some people would say social media has a huge role to play. Certainly the current headlines are backing that up. And perhaps it's the evolution of the human race needing to break through to a better place. So many, many complex answers to a very complex question. It is. And yet you, your book, you know, you want to share that there's so much that's beautiful going on all around the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've been very gifted to get to see many of the visuals, to meet many of the people, to experience many of the cultures. And I do find that travel, excuse me, <laughs> is so broadening and so educational and helps to move us past those artificial divisions that we have between us. Well, also, your, your experience is massive. You talk about a 10,000-mile journey on public transportation. What was, was that young. about? <laughs> I was young. I was fearless. I thought that, you know, I thought that as many anthropologists feel that the sooner I could get into the field the sooner I could experience conditions as the people live them, removing all the filters of my Americanization, Westernization, uh, as I said, coming from the land of flush toilets and automatic doors. um, I wanted to experience the people and be as close to them as I possibly could, which is why I chose to do it on public transportation. And I also did, you know, very similar travels, but not in the Middle East, Really, most of my travels were through South America, Ah. where I actually spent many, many years also on public buses and (laughs) and also hitchhiking on donkey carts, etc., to travel throughout areas where there were no roads. And I had no time limit, which it looks like you didn't in those days. And I stayed there for years living in a grass shack. How wonderful. What What a phenomenal experience you had. Well, that's how you, like you, you did, really get to know what's going on, you know, with the individuals. But I have to say, in terms of you, um, you know, you are tall, beautiful, and blonde. Thank you. And I have to say, when I was living in Mexico, nobody would look at me twice because I'm, you know, short, Mediterranean looking, fit right in with the people. But that must have been another experience. Yeah, it was. There was no way that I could... Looked, I could make myself look like the other people, even veiled. If I went through the whole thing with the veils, my light skin, my light eyes would kind of give me away. And the heat was so oppressive. I don't know how the women there tolerated those heavy tent-like chadris or burkas, as we call them in the West. It, it's almost almost incomprehensible to me that they could wear that in the heat. But so, yeah, I went, I was trying to be respectful. I went about my business with a long skirt. I had a long sleeve shirt over my tank top and I wore a small scarf just really as a sign of respect to the local customs. Right. Because that would be really interesting to see. I mean, was there any like dangerous things that might have happened because of who you are and you were there alone? Constantly, every day. Uh, I couldn't even go to the shower alone. I had to have an escort to the shower and in the shower because there were peepholes in all the showers so that the the people who worked in the hotel could spy on the guests. And a, a woman alone, even walking through a hotel corridor, would have been accosted. And I was many times, but I was fortunate 
I was sent uh, a wonderful group of uh, rugged men who were traveling overland across uh, the Middle East back to their homes in Australia and New Zealand. I had an American friend who was going to India who traveled with us. So I was very well protected along that trip. And there were, you know, there was an attempted rape uh, when I fell asleep in the back of a bus and all my friends had gotten off to have tea somewhere out in the desert. There were some very, very challenging experiences. I would imagine. But in, in a way, you know, you were looking for those adventures or you wouldn't be there. Not that the bad <laughs> ones, but, you know, that's always a possibility when we put ourselves in that kind of, um, you know, situation. Very true. Now, looking at the table of contents of your book, Global, A Traveler's Tale, you say you recently updated it. Did the chapter headings change or is that still? No, the chapter headed, headings did not really significantly change. I'll just point out one small detail, Ellen. It's ta- Traveler's Tales, if it matters. Well, Global, A Traveler's Tales. Thank you. And, and we are going to have a link specifically to your book so people can easily find it. Thank you. But let's talk about some of these because they sound really interesting, like Helen in Persia. (laughs) Those were experiences I had going through Iran, and I love calling Iran Persia. I love Persian high culture, but uh, there was my face at the bus window, which elicited a rush of purchasers, people who wanted to purchase me and thought that they could negotiate my price with uh, the men I was traveling with. So some of them jumped on the bus, dropped everything they were doing, jumped on the bus, stayed a couple of hours, and some of them stayed all day bargaining hard uh, to get to take me home. And uh, other than that initial glance, my feelings or my reactions were completely ignored. It was a chilling experience. And you think that was because you were a woman? Because I was a Western woman alone, uh, not alone, I had a group with me, but in spirit, many ways, I was alone, out in the middle of um, deserts where a face like that is a rarity. I imagine. So that's really, that's an interesting chapter heading, as so many of them are. I love the one called um, Gone in Ghana. (laughs) <laughs> the Hajj, gone in Ghana. I mean, that's another whole area. It was another whole area. Yeah, I, I transitioned from being the backpacked, sandaled uh, graduate student in anthropology to taking a job in the airline industry as it was transitioning from the glory days of stewardessing to the cattle car charters that became very prominent. Uh, And those cattle car conditions we know still persist. So uh, I got very lucky. I was uh, awarded a trip to the Hajj in Ghana and Nigeria. And the Hajj is, of course, the annual pilgrimage that um, the Muslim faithful make to Mecca. And uh, Jeddah Airport is about 12 miles away from Mecca. And... um, that was a, that chapter is connected to that story. I was based in Ghana, and for that month I was a reserve, didn't have to work, and had a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful romance under the October moon, hanging above the equator with an American pilot who was also over there. Um, does that have anything, any link to when you went to, um, you say you have a son who is in that area? Uh, My son is in Australia. Oh, okay. And does he live there? He does. He's married and he lives there and he's quite happy. I've never been to Australia either. That's, you know, a long trip as well. Another interesting location. Yes, very much so. Oceana is quite, uh, it's, it's such a contrast because in the parts that were settled by the British, you know, New Zealand, parts of Australia, you have this strong presence of British civility and control and veneer and underneath, you know, especially in New Zealand, um, you have these these fumaroles and geysers and earthquakes and really uh, primitive, in the positive sense, earth energy. So it's really fascinating. Australia is, kind of, I didn't see a lot of it. I just went to a couple of places in Australia, but um, I hope to go back. And um, Australia is very much like the front- frontier, like you would imagine the West was in the late 1800s. 
Well, I want to remind our listeners that you are listening to Herbally Yours on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse at naturalnurse.com. And my guest today is Dr. Jean DeBrandt, um, and she's talking about her international adventures and her book, Global, A Traveler's Tales. And you can find it just by Googling it, Global, A Traveler's Tales. And also, we will have a link on our radio show archive. And we'd like you to know that here at WHPC, we have a a very wonderful radio archive where you can listen to many of our shows, which are also broadcast on i heart radio um the whole world is becoming an international playground dr brand which <laughs> which it has been for you for so many decades um you talked about ghana a little bit one of my really wonderful herbalist teachers was from ghana his name is dr anthony kwiku ando wow. and he was a Ghanaian herbalist who has since passed away but very luckily as you know, in, in herbs, sometimes that knowledge is passed down through generations, which is so important. Absolutely. And his son-in-law, his name is Essex, now is gathering all of Dr. Ando's teachings because he wrote many books, but this was before the internet. And like you pointed out, you know, before the internet and after the internet are like two completely different times in history. Absolutely different eras. I'm very pleased that he's doing that. I know people who are also going around China and videoing and collecting uh, for that very same purpose. Let's preserve the, uh, the knowledge and pass it down. And that history of oral tradition um, exists in many cultures and um, sadly, much of it is lost. Well, in your travels, you must have come across some interesting, not only herbal, but other sort of native in whatever area, traditional healing techniques. Oh, I absolutely did. Um, when I was in India, I had a dysentery, which I had picked up, you know, along the trail. And I was treated by a um, Sikh doctor who did, practiced Ayurveda, and he prescribed for me some little, you know, lactose-based pills. And I remember as a, you know, a young Westerner saying, now, what is this going to do? And it was absolutely amazing. And it wasn't until those little uh, seemingly innocuous pills ran out on the night train back to Delhi uh, that I, and I woke up with severe cramping, that I realized just how powerful they were. I mean, that was an amazing experience. I also spent time in Belize and the jungles in Belize, the rainforest in Belize, um, where the pioneering work was done by um, Rosita Arvigo and um, was able to bring some of my students there and watch and experience and taste and hold and smell some of those herbs growing in their natural environment. A lot of what you do is certainly sounds like something an anthropologist would be interested in. And did you have a path in that direction as well? I did. When I was an undergraduate, I was very undecided between psychology and anthropology. So I did a double major. And then uh, I did pursue graduate studies in anthropology. But in those days, jobs for PhDs were very rare. And it just seemed as if I went through the entire program, uh, getting employment afterwards would be iffy. So I I actually, that's when I chose to go into chiropractic school. But you didn't lose your interest. And in your book, you talk about the most fascinating um, teachers that you had, too. Like you have somewhere in here that you sat at the feet of Margaret Mead. I did. That was a real honor. Um, I was not enrolled in a class of hers, but I went to lectures that she offered and um, was a recipient of her great cultural wisdom. Well, there's so much that you did. And, you know, what, what other things would you like to share with our listeners? Because it's endless. For instance, um, you, like you said, you were a stewardess. My neighbor, it, she says... <laughs> lovingly she she retired this year because of the covid pandemic 
<laughs> but before that, she said, well, I've been an airline. I, I've been employed so long that I was a stewardess. Because in other <laughs> words, they don't use those, that word anymore. It's like a dirty word now. It's so funny. Yes. When I was, when I was working, that's when FA first came out, flight attendant. F-A, oh. FE for flight engineer. And I forget what the captain was called, but everybody had an F title. Yeah. So she said, you know, she still likes using that term, but it's, it's become, you know, very outdated. Very much so. Now, this is a difficult question. Is with all your travels in so many areas of the world, would you say that things are more different or more the same between, you know, overall um, humans everywhere in the world? I think that the evolution of the uh, understanding the genome and DNA has really shown us how similar we are, how, the, how we are all homo sapiens sapiens, how there are no real distinctions of race. And most of the distinctions that we make are cultural distinctions. That said, the appreciation of those ideas, the understanding of those ideas seems farther and more elusive than ever. Wow. <laughs> but, you know, because I noticed that when I was in college even, I bought this uh, blouse to where to go to concerts, right? Mm. And then I was living in a dorm, which was great because I, like you, have always been very interested in international everything, you know, the group of people. So even my children are mixed, et cetera. Mine are too. See? I have a Chinese daughter. <laughs> this happens for that reason, you know, that what you're drawn to. But when I wore this one um, piece of clothing, all the the guys who were Indian and Pakistani, when I walked past, were just like falling on the floor in hysterics. And I couldn't understand it. So I asked a woman of, of that kind of culture. And she said, well, you're walking around just wearing a bra. <laughs> because it wasn't like here. It was sort of a top that you might wear to a concert, you know, hippie style, of course. <laughs> but it was what they wear under saris. Oh. And it's considered underwear, underwear. in that wow. culture. So it wow. was just really interesting, the difference in perspective. And I once wore um, a top that I was very proud of. Uh, basically, a, to me, it looked sort of like an, from India. And I was in Egypt at the time at a hotel. And I had the same experience. People were laughing and looking at me, the side eye, the whole thing. And it turns out what I was wearing was a man's garment. And it was considered inappropriate that a woman would wear this at a hotel in Cairo. Yeah, I, I mean, you must have come across so many things like that because of the difference in perspective. Yeah. And so tell us about your daughter in China. Does she live there still? No, my, I brought my daughter out of an orphanage in China. It is a very interesting story because my grandfather had traveled in China. I, I got the traveler wanderer genes from him. And he had been in China in the early, I guess, 1900s, and he saved the life of a girl who had fallen off of her parents' sampan in the Yangtze River. So my mother always told that story and felt the connection to this lost karmic child. Um, when I went to adopt a daughter after having three biological sons, I went through uh, numerous different scenarios and agencies and whatever, but finally adopted a little girl, went to China to get her, and her orphanage was on the banks of the Yangtze River. So that in itself was definitely um, an interesting yes, succession like of events. It was. A, I felt like the circle closed, and now she's a uh, neuroscience researcher and a physicist and doing beautifully. So you've also journeyed to the north. See, I'm telling you, I journeyed a lot in the south, but <laughs> never to the north, because you're talking about um, battling currents on your flimsy boat to Antarctica. <laughs> yes, well, that was actually very far south. I've been to the north. I lived in Denmark for a while. But that particular journey was my last great adventure out in the Pacific off of Tahiti Edi, which is a uh, the back part of Tahiti. It's a separate, quote, island peninsula. The division isn't clear. 
But I was out in a lake boat with a man who thought that that boat was sufficient to the Pacific. And having grown up on boats, I quickly realized we had nothing. We had no radio. We had no life rafts. We had no poles to fend off the rocks, you know, numerous other things. And we were being swept into the Antarctic currents because Antarctica was next after Tahiti. Fortunately, we ran aground on rocks. Other things happened. And um, I lived to tell about it. Yeah, you because you're here on our show after <laughs> so many unbelievable adventures. And, you know, what about what has been your struggle with the fact that, you know, traveling has not been so available the last few years? Yeah, it's, it's been an enormous uh, lifestyle change for me, not being able to plan any trips, not being able to um, immerse myself in anything other than uh, American culture and being home. But, you know, I love uh, my home. I love nature. And nature has been a great solace for me. And uh, it's been an interesting time to reconnect with my roots and with um, writing. I'm uh, doing a lot more writing and made, making those adaptations that we all have to make uh, under the current circumstances. But it looks like you'll be getting back on the road pretty soon. I, open things I intend to go to Easter Island in Chile. That's my next uh, exotic destination. Well, that's interesting because my guest, and you can look at the archives where your show will be also. Um, I just had a guest on from Chile who was part of the Chilean revolution. Ooh. And he wrote a book about his experiences, which are not so happy as yours because he was actually um, a soldier, a, a sailor who wound up being in a concentration camp because he did not agree to uh, kill his Chilean co-citizens wow. as, as being a sailor. So it's interesting that you brought up Chile. So people from all over the world have unbelievably interesting experiences. We're, well, we're almost at the end of our show today, Dr. Jane, but what would you like to leave as a message to our listeners? Uh, we're all one, scientifically, spiritually, and hopefully we can all try to spread that connection to other beings, other human beings. Yeah, that, that's a very wise sharing for right now, especially because, you know, things are, are so challenging in the world. And your interest in Afghanistan is, is really prominent because, you know, so many people from there are now here. So yes. perhaps you can do some bridge work to help that be a smoother transition since you've been so much a part of their culture too. That was part of my reason in getting the book out now to, in support of uh, the peoples of Afghanistan, particularly the women. Well, I want to thank you so much for being our guest and also thank our listeners. So thank you for tuning into Herbally Yours, produced in the studios of 90.3 WHPC, Nassau Community College, Garden City, New York. For further information, email us at whpc at ncc.edu. This is your host, Ellen Kamai at naturalnurse.com, inviting you to join us next week for another edition of Herbally Yours. Until then, stay healthy.